Good morning all and welcome to the State of the Service Roadshow event for Victoria. My name is Mark Ryan and I will be your MC and facilitator for today. Thank you everyone for joining us online today. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on whose country I present from today, which is the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I would like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional custodians on whose country that you are participating from today. Now, just a quick overview of how today will run. To start, we'll be using a program called Slido for some public service trivia. Then there will be a keynote address, uh, which will be delivered by the Australian Public Service Deputy Commissioner, Helen Wilson, followed by a short panel discussion. And then your questions will be answered by the panel. All questions can be submitted via the Q&A function on the Slido chat. There is a QR code on the screen now that will take you to the Slido app. Simply take out your mobile and scan the code. You can also enter the number on screen at Slido's website to join from your browser. For those of you who are on the site, you should see the first, the first question now. There is 20 seconds on the clock for everyone to answer before we will show you the correct answers. So the answer to the most popular male name is David. What is the most popular female name for Australian public servants in Victoria? So the answer for that one is Michelle. What is the average age of the Australian public servant in Victoria? The answer is 44. What are the top three most common countries of birth outside of Australia for Victorian APS employees? And the answer is India, England, and Sri Lanka. Okay. Well, wasn't that interesting? Thank you to everyone who played along. Apologies for those uh, technical glitches, but this is just what happens and we're just going to roll with it. So I just want to say thanks to Mark. He was about to hand over to me anyway. And thank you for all, thank you for all joining us today online. It's wonderful to have you here and connected to this event. And did you know there's over 26,700 public servants right across the great state of Victoria? This is our chance to come together as a community 
to listen to one another and to share our knowledge and experiences as public servants. And today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Natalie James, who is the Secretary of the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations, and Rebecca Falkingham, who is the CEO of the National Disability Insurance Agency. So welcome to Natalie and to Rebecca. And can I also just say, happy International Women's Day for yesterday. We're gonna be your panel today and we're here to answer your questions. I wanna start by saying the Australian Public Service is operating in an increasingly complex environment. That's for a range of reasons. We've got ongoing economic and social challenges post COVID-19, natural disasters. We've got recent geopolitical disruptions right across the world. And we all know that we're increasingly operating in a very tight labor market. To address these and build a public service for the future, we wanna make sure that the Australian public service embodies integrity in everything that we do that we put people and business at the centre of policy and services. We want to make sure that we're a model employer and we want to make sure that all of you have the capability to do your jobs well. We're not perfect and we're going to have to continue to build trust. We're going to have to continue to collaborate and learn from one another but we are gonna be a great place and are a great place to work and we're gonna meet the challenges of this increasingly complex and interconnected world together. I thought today I'd touch on four things. I'm gonna talk about the wonderful APS Academy. I'm gonna talk a bit about integrity, leadership, and then workforce issues, including disability, diversity, and a topic that is becoming very popular, flexibility. So the APS Academy, one of the ways that we can continue to grow and develop as public servants is through the APS Academy. It provides an integrated whole of service approach to learning and development. The Academy is focused on equipping all of us with the necessary foundations to deliver great policy and services, these being the APS crafts. We have a responsibility to commit to learning and developing our skills. I encourage you all to head to the ABS, uh, APS Academy website and see the selection of courses on offer. And I know my staff are going to put a link up in the chat box right now. And you can also sign up for the My Academy newsletter, which will give you regular updates on all the courses that are available. Integrity is the core APS craft. It's fundamental to maintaining the trust of the community. We do have a high standard of integrity and professionalism, but to safeguard this, we really do need to strengthen our integrity culture. The Commission has published an integrity metrics resource, and this is really designed to help you and to help agencies understand their current integrity measurement capability and to help agencies make informed decisions on where to focus effort. Integrity just means doing the right thing at the right time to deliver the best outcomes for Australians as sought by the government of the day. Leadership. To build a culture of integrity, we need to lead by example and the new Secretary's Charter of Leadership Behaviours sets out the expectations we have for APS leadership. The Commission manages a range of leadership and talent development programs to support emerging and current leaders and we've got a real focus on current leaders at the moment. When I think about when I was an EL2, versus what some of our EL staff are faced with now. Today, our managers, our emerging leaders, you're managing increasingly diverse workforces that are increasingly geographically dispersed in the digital age. So a priority for the Commission at the moment is really to focus on those emerging leaders. I thought I'd now turn to workforce issues. Mobility is increasing across the public service and this is a great thing. In 21-22, we saw a 5.4% increase in staff 
taking up mobility opportunities on a permanent basis. And that's the highest annual rate that we've had in two decades. The mobility framework was released in 2021. And look, mobility enhances the capability of employees and organisations. I like to say that mobility really helps us learn to speak other people's languages. It exposes you to different roles and workplaces. It increases your skills and your experiences. And it does help all of us to build deeper networks and understand the variety of roles right across the service. If you're interested in finding out more about mobility opportunities for you or a member of your team, please visit the APS Jobs website and go to the Temporary Opportunities tab. So a skilled workforce. The APS Workforce Strategy 2025 is supporting a cultural shift in strategic workforce planning. The strategy is supported by three professional streams. They are data, digital and human resource professions. And those professional streams are really about lifting the data and digital and HR expertise of the workforce, particularly the SES. Developing entry pathways and career development opportunities right across all three streams is helping the APS become a more attractive organisation to join and more attractive place to stay. There are two other recent initiatives that I want to mention and they're the Affirmative Measure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Recruitment Hub, which was launched in July 2022 and the Affirmative Measure Disability Employment Recruitment Hub, which was launched in November 2022. We know that we need to do more to broaden the way that we attract and retain a talented and diverse workforce. We need to invest in people and we need to nurture people to ensure their careers are rewarding. To enhance our employee value proposition, we're exploring options around location, around flexibility. We're looking to reinvest in internal capability and reduce our reliance on external expertise. The Commission is currently developing a service-wide, APS-wide approach to flexibility, and I'm sure you're going to have questions on that. And while agency heads will continue to be best placed to make decisions about the operational requirements of their agency in a competitive labour market, there is no doubt there's a compelling case to support greater flexibility across the service and embed flexible work as part of our employee value proposition. To ensure flexibility works for everyone, arrangements must suit not just the individual, but they've got to suit teams and they've got to suit uh, the agency. So look in closing, and I do feel like I say this every single year, but 2023 is going to be a big year for the Australian Public Service. Things really don't look like they're going to slow down anytime soon. So I challenge you all not only to continue to do the incredible work that you do, but also to take care of yourself and of one another. Thanks again for tuning in today and we're on the panel all looking forward to the discussion and lovely Mark, it's back to you. And Mark, I think, apologies everyone, but we're having a lot of fun today. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Helen. And yes, I'm sure everybody's aware of uh, how wonderful technology can be and the bigger the invent the more it decides not to work as well as it should do. So thank you, Helen, for that, um, for that update. Um, the State of the Service Roadshow is an annual occasion where we come together and talk through ideas for the public service. We can also share our stories and experiences. The Australian Public Service Commission is capturing some of those stories, and we will now show a trailer of some of those stories that have been captured so far. My name is Leanne. I'm based in Canberra. I work at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and this is my story. Hello, my name is Ben. My name is Sanam Safar. Yeah, my name's Hannah. My name is Mohammed Al Abri. I'm Grant Nicholson. My name is Robin Edmonds. My name's Andrew Pfeiffer. Hey there, my name is Bell Hogg. My name is Nathan Kopatz, and this is my APS story. 
So I got to uh, talk to different agencies, see inside uh, their cultures and their initiatives and what they were doing. And I thought, wow, there's so much going on in the APS. I, I really need to uh, broaden my horizons. Starting out in service delivery, taking calls from Australians who were unemployed and hearing some stories that broke my heart. And that really started off a very um, rewarding time being able to help the Australian public and that hasn't changed. Um, there's plenty of opportunity around now. They've got some, a thing called the a development register that if you're interested in developing your career and working your way up from maybe as a team leader. I continue to learn and share all around government uh, through the amazing communities that, that I've been involved with. Um, there's a, um, a thing called the digital profession and I'm running a visual scribing community. So um, we have local, state, federal, all kinds of um, different government agencies, departments um, that come together. The advice to, that I would give to people is um, do experience uh, time in other organisations. It's well worth it to uh, uh, expand your horizons and to go and, and spend time discovering what other agencies do and, and sharing your talent around. But at the same time, if, you, if you're comfortable in the organisation you are, you can, you're adding value there, there is value for the organisation in you staying for a period of time in the organisation. Bring like-minded people together. We share webinars, we bring in speakers and we hold events like code swaps. The next big event we're trying to hold is an APS-wide uh, event for Clean Up Australia Day on the 5th of March 2023. We hope to see you there. I started up their Neurodiversity Network, which grew to 400 members in one year. And I was super thrilled that the ATO supported me in co-founding their network. And so we decided to bring people together for a bit of a meeting just to explore what it was that agencies were already doing, what they were maybe aware of, what they thought were opportunities, what they really wanted to learn. So we kind of wanted to have this exploratory meeting just to, I guess, gauge the level of interest and maturity, if you will, right, with, with neurodiversity awareness and inclusion across the APS. So there was so much support because I was at the learning stage. People were there to support me, help me, gave me like the network and development opportunities. But within APS 6, it's something I have to find on my own. Um, but it's really amazing and challenging for me because this, this was something I was looking for that where I can challenge myself, get out of the comfort zone and uh, maybe an inspiration for others. My highlight was definitely the evaluation workshop I led because it directly led to the agency changing its HR processes in a meaningful way. So I thought it was very impactful. My key takeaway from this whole experience work on the project is that each and every person has power to create change. My name is Leanne. I'm based in Canberra. Thank you. I work Thank you so much for that. Um, we are now going to move into our panel discussion. Just a reminder, if you have any questions for the panel, um, please send them through the, via the Slido Q&A chat function. Um, if you see a question and you really want to hear the answer, you can like the question in the chat function to vote it up. The more votes, the more likely the question will be answered. Now I'd like to introduce our panellists. First of all, we have Natalie James, Secretary at the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations. And then we have Rebecca Falkingham, um, PSM and the CEO at the National Disability Insurance Agency. Thank you all for joining us um, today. And I have a few questions to start off our discussion before we turn you loose onto the audience. So the first question is, 82% of staff in Victoria are either generation X or Y with only 1.3% of our staff being in the generation Z. What do you think we can be doing to encourage younger people to join the public service and to share their skills and knowledge. And I'll throw that open to the panel to whoever wants to take it first. All right, Natalie, why don't you have a go? <laughs> um, I was, I, as you were talking, Mark, I was reflecting, it's like, well, I'm a 50-year-old woman. What would I know? Um, but I guess 
Um, what I might talk about a little is, uh, you know, I, my last job before I took on the role of Secretary of um, the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations was at Deloitte, a consulting firm, and uh, I suspect the age profile there is a lot younger than the public service. I should also say the diversity profile, I think, was um, was quite different as well. And one of the things that um, people told me they liked was the agile way in which we worked. The fact that they had access to partners. So in our APS, I believe that the, the hierarchical structures we have often work against uh, us being as impactful as we might be, having the conversations we need to have. And certainly in consulting, there's a much flatter structure and it's very common for new starters in, in a place like Deloitte to be encouraged to go and talk to all the partners. And so this idea that uh, as a partner, you don't talk to our graduates or new starters, that's not the ethos at all. And, and I think we could take some of that on here. Leadership is about being available to everyone. And uh, it's about breaking down these ideas that you're only expected to have an idea or a point of view when you are in the SES and have a corner office. And so I think these are the things we really need to think about. The other thing I would say is if we really want to uh, think about what we need to do to attract uh, younger people into the public service, ask our graduates. I might just add to Nat's answer. I think that uh, Gen Z gets a really bad rep. Um, and uh, I think that um, one of the things that I really admire about Gen Z is that they, they have a strong sense of purpose. And I think we have that in bucket loads in the APS and we need to do a better job of communicating with Gen Z about why what we do brings purpose to their lives. Because I think we focus a lot on flexibility and um, that's all really important, but they know what they'll do and they know what they won't do, which I, I am really um, in great admiration of. So I think that how we communicate, how our work changes changes lives every single day is something that would be really attractive to Gen Z. So I think we need to get out there and talk much more about the absolute diversity in roles we have in the APS. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I think the idea of uh, chatting with the graduates is probably the best way forward if we want to engage with that cohort and um, bring more of them in. So maybe that's something we can all take on board. Uh, what I'd like to do is, and it actually segues quite nicely from graduates, is learning and development opportunities uh, can be formal in, and informal in the public service. Um, what are some of the informal training that you have done that has been useful in your career? And I'll actually address this to all three panellists so that you can share your own experiences in this space. All right, I'm going to go Natalie and then I'll, and then Rebecca, how about that? <laughs> It's interesting. I, I don't, I'm not sure I know what an informal training... Uh, look, let, what I would reflect on is I think I have learnt some great things from formal training, especially leadership training. But I think what you really learn um, or, or the, the real things that you learn are, are from doing your job and talking with people. And I'll give an example. Last week I was with some secretaries and the head of the National Indigenous Australians Agency, Jodie Bruin, in Alice Springs and out on community in Alice Springs. And, and I learnt more from talking to people in their community than I would ever learn in any sort of formal training session. And, and so I think it's about being open. It's about listening to a broad range of points of view and engaging with the people we serve. I'm going to second that. Yeah. Uh, my husband thinks I buy and drink an extraordinary amount of coffee. I take people at all levels out for coffee and I try to do that sort of leadership. You should really use your ears and your mouth in that ratio. You should do a hell of a lot more listening. So the informal for me is taking people out for coffee, asking a few questions, being curious, but then listening. As Victorian, I wholeheartedly support the coffee. Um, uh, but just to add to uh, Nat and, and Helen, I, I think some of the, the greatest informal training I've ever had was a lot of the work I did in intergovernmental relations. So working with the Commonwealth, working with the states, getting a sense of how unique every state and territory is and, and how they work quite differently. And um, everyone is always, what I love about both state and Commonwealth public service is how open people are with their time to share their work, to share their understanding. And the other 
another area I'd really encourage people to look at is going into services, um, uh, understanding kind of the pressures services are facing directly, uh, spending time, we heard in some of our, our APS stories about just spending time actually taking calls from Australians. There's no greater training um, than that. And you've got lots of opportunities to go into different services right across the APS and learn about what different people are doing. And sorry, Mark, I have to give a quick plug now for the APS uh, job surge reserve, <laughs> all right, which is a great way to have that opportunity. And a decent plug, that is, which is excellent. Um, so the very first question that's come through has been, um, a lot of jobs are still being advertised as in the office only, which is a bit outdated. Will we see this change soon? And I'd like to start with um, Rebecca first on this one. Thanks, Mark. I, I'm trying not to get myself in trouble with the answer on this one. Um, but I, um, uh, having spent um, COVID working as Victorian Public Service, we took a very, very strong view that all roles were flex. And the most important thing you can do is have a conversation with an individual um, about what the impacts of how they're going to work um, will have not only on them and their own lives, but also on the team and the organisation as a whole. I think we need to have a lot of conversations to get people to understand kind of we need to be flexible, but we need to think about the overall organisational goals as well. And what was really important to me during COVID was um, having that connection from a wellbeing perspective so that we can we can make sure that, that the people are um, uh, in a good place, that they're able to do their work really clearly, that managers are able to manage to outcomes. And I think that we're going to do a lot more work of that within the NDIA. We have obviously over 153 officers right across the country, um, but we also have um, a really important conversation to have with our front line because we spent a lot of time talking about um, flexible working. For a lot of our front line, they don't have that opportunity. So thinking about how we can better support our front line to have more flexible roles um, is really important to me. Thank you. Um, so I'll actually lead into the next one, unless there's someone else. Um, Natalie or Helen, you want to? No, not buying in on that one. Okay. Sorry? Sorry, I think it's like we've got that tiny delay. Mark, I, I might just say one thing. I'm surprised if jobs are being advertised in that way. Uh, you know, I, I think that there are certain defaults we have, but, but certainly in my department, we have a large number of people who are working some days at home. We have uh, a significant number of people whose teams are based in a particular place, but they're based in our other offices. And so, um, but I, I would reinforce what Rebecca said about role, like different jobs have different requirements. And so all roles can have a degree of flexibility, but it's different. And, and so I think what we all need to be doing is being open to the conversation about what, what are your preferences and what are your needs, but also what does the team need and what does the role require? Yes. Thank you for that. And yes, it is important to actually consider what um, what the individuals and the teams need together. Some people can do their roles remotely, but they actually prefer the community of being in at the office. So all aspects need to be considered when we're looking at this. Um, the next question is, how long do you think that the bargaining process will take to ensure pay parity between agencies? And I think I'd like to address this one to Helen. Look, thanks, Mark. I'm just going to begin by saying the government is committed to a fair and equitable pay rise for all APS employees. It's really hard for me to give you a timeline. I can tell you that the task force in the Commission is working really hard and is looking to start that centralised service-wide bargaining process as quickly as possible, so around late March. So again, I'm just going to reiterate, the task force is looking to start the process as quickly as possible so that staff can receive timely pay increases. But the details around how long that's going to take is really a matter for bargaining and for the negotiations. So I really can't provide sort of further detail at this stage. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Um, given the positive um, recent worldwide results, uh, uh, are you considering the four day work week? Uh, and that one may link back into the bargaining. So I'll start with Helen. And then if uh, Rebecca or Natalie have some thoughts, I'd appreciate their thoughts. Yeah, look, I'm just gonna flip the question around a little bit. 
I mean, flexibility can mean a range of things. It can mean location, it can mean hours, it can mean access to leave. And as we've all just kind of said, first of all, the Commission is about to uh, release some principles around what we call flexible work arrangements. And it just goes back to the point that we're all making. Have a conversation, all right? Mutually beneficial for you for your team, for your agency, a lot of people will always value face-to-face. -face. So it's not so much about how many days a week, it's about the flexibility that's going to work for you as an individual, for your team and for the organisation. Thank you. I'll just add, Mark, I always think it's a really funny um, conversation, like the four day week is a really new concept, uh, particularly for women. Um, a four day week has been a big part of flexible working for a long time. I know when I came back from having children, I worked four days a week and, and that worked for me during that kind of time. And as Helen says, I think the really important role is that conversation you have. You know, there's a whole range of um, uh, APS arrangements that people can have in place to support their flexibility. I, I think the, the conversation conversation needs to be much broader than just a four day week um, and it goes to the whole range of, of ways people would like to work into the future. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think that the four day week has been around uh, or the capacity for it has been around for some time. It's just, I guess this is taking it to the next step of more formalising that. Um, in line with that, is there, a, is there a vision to change the way that recruitment and promotion works within the APS? So a lot of staff are performing higher duties for extended periods without promotion. And um, Natalie, if I could get your thoughts on that first. Look, I, um, I, 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 th there's often acting arrangements in departments that are formal. I'm, I'm not aware of people performing higher duties without that being acknowledged. And, and so, you know, I think if people feel that's happening, they, they need to be talking within their own workplace about that. Um, there are elements of our um, recruitment and promotion, quite a lot of it is actually set out under our Public Service Act and other rules, which I'm sure Helen could talk to. And uh, one thing I would say is I'm very determined to get our recruitment happening faster. And I, I know in my department, um, you know, we are recruiting quite a lot and that's putting a load on our HR teams. And so, of course, we want to be as flexible as we can, but uh, merit recruitment and promotion is at the core of the public service and has been forever. And it, it, it's part of that integrity piece. So I'm, I'm not sure if Helen wants to comment a little bit more on that, but I think we do need to remember that, uh, there, that it is about balancing these different imperatives. Thanks, Nat. Look, and it's a great point. The merit uh, principle is gonna remain at the core of our recruitment. But are we looking at changing recruitment practices? Absolutely. So it goes to Nat's point, can we do this in a more efficient and effective way? And I wanna pick up on one of the stories from the video. We need to change our recruitment practices if we're to have a more diverse workforce. So neurodiversity, I have recently come from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So shout out to all those that are listening from the ABS. And in the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the neurodiversity network was really strong and proactive in saying to senior leaders, you have to change the way that you recruit. We've all been in interviews where it feels like a test. So doing different things when we're recruiting uh, is really necessary. So thinking about that it doesn't just have to be based on an interview, that there can be a, way, a range of ways that people can demonstrate their skills. It doesn't just have to be based on an interview. So yeah, there's lots of ways that we can definitely change the practice or the way that we recruit people. Just to add to Helen, Mark, um, I've only been in the role for four months, but um, two weeks into my role, um, it became very clear that uh, we've got a lot of work to do with um, inclusivity with our recruitment. Uh, we were recruiting for a role in the NDIA, which had an um, inherent requirement that you had to change attire. And you can imagine how people with disability would feel about being asked to change a tyre. And as I point out, that if I had to change a tyre, I wouldn't be in my role either. Um, so I think just doing a lot of work, looking at those real basic things that we take for granted, the, 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 the comments about neurodiversity, like really thinking very creatively and talking to our networks about what would work better to get more recruitment um, right across um, all forms of disability. 
Thank you for that. And I, I couldn't agree more. There's a number of people out there that aren't actually uh, accepting roles because of the challenges of either transport or, or access to buildings or things like that. And we just need to look at how we're going to embrace those people because there are gold mines out there that could bring a wealth of experience and knowledge to us. Um, so the next question has come through. It's, um, will there be any changes occurring in the wake of the RoboDebt um, RC hearings? And particularly in regards to the APS being apolitical, frank and fearless in advice to government. And I'll throw this one to Helen, I think. Look, that's a great question. So thank you to whoever asked that question. And there's no doubt that the RoboDebt is bringing forward a range of issues around culture, around behaviour, around record keeping practices, around legal advice. So there's no doubt that, and the, the question went to that frank and fearless, such a great point. As public servants, we need to remain impartial. We need to provide frank and fearless advice. We do need to let the process uh, play out, all right? So we need to await the final report of the Royal Commission in late June, but there's already a range of things that are underway that go to some of these issues around looking at the SES performance framework, about looking at ensuring that public servants have access to things like, you know, best practice record keeping. I might pause there and just, because I, I do think um, Rebecca or Nat might want to just say something in uh, response to that question too. Uh, look, it, it's, it's an obvious thing that we're all thinking about and reflecting on as we hear the coverage of the Commission or maybe even dip in and, and watch ourselves. Um, it's, there's some challenging things arising from it. Now, when, when all this was happening, I was not in the public service by and large, so I was observing it like any other member of the community, living in Melbourne, reading the papers and, and, and sort of trying to get a sense of what's actually going on here. And, and so one of the things I would say, well, I'm going to say two things. Firstly, culture is critical and that culture of, of ensuring that people are able to speak up and when they speak up, they are heard and there is a respectful environment. I, you know, I, I think that that's a really important piece. And so, you know, I, I also think that there's nothing to stop us having conversations now about what we think it might mean for us. I don't know that we can say that the culture in the departments under scrutiny here is any different from culture elsewhere in the public service. So I think it's really important that we all consider there but for the grace of God go I, um, what sort of situations have we found ourselves in and how do we reflect on that and make sure that we've got uh, the, the systems in place and the culture in place to ensure that if we feel something isn't right, we're able to say it. And just to add to that, um, Mark, I've been really um, blown away by the number of junior staff um, within the NDI that want to actually have an open conversation about what is playing out in the Royal Commission. And I've reflected a lot on what Nat has said um, since she's um, been in her secretary role about hierarchy and kind of what that brings to the public sector and, and how do we create a safe environment for every single level um, uh, to feel safe, that they can speak out, that there are no reprisals for speaking out, um, that there are appropriate processes put in place that when you feel you can't do that openly. I think that um, having the conversation now, I think will put the APS in a really good position into the future, particularly with future generations coming through um, to, to start to reflect what they see as integrity kind of within all of our departments and agencies. So I just think having the conversations right now are really important. I couldn't agree more. And I think this will be one of those examples that's used in the future about how integrity and frank and fearless conversations are important within our day-to-day -day lives within the public service. Um, so, which actually leads quite nicely into the next question, which is what can we do to support staff well-being during extremely busy periods and stressful periods, such as restructures um, or even commissions or, or uh, inquiries? And I think I will start with, um, with Natalie on this one. Oh, look, um, this is tough, right? I, I think that we, 
We need to be putting well-being at the centre of all that we do. There are a lot of pressures and I'm going through only my second budget as a secretary and I can see just the pressures of BAU uh, in terms of the volume of work and, and the, the deadlines. If you layer on top of that some um, additional things like, like being involved in, in a process like the Royal Commission or having a lot of change around us, I, I, I think what we need to do is that the first thing is we need to know what we need, right? So uh, what, what is it you need to uh, be able to do your job well, to be able to run your life and, and are you able to articulate that within your team and, and your workplace? One thing I have found as secretary is um, a lot of the time I seem to be telling people around me to stop working, um, to not do that now, that can wait. Um, and, and to really ask the question, what needs to be done and to what level of perfection? Now, maybe this will get me into trouble, but I see such excellent work around me, but sometimes I look at it and I think, how many people were involved in this and how many hours went into it? You know, in consulting, we call that overwork and that costs money. Now, that's not the environment we're in, but I do think it still costs something. It costs your time and your effort and other things you might have been doing if, if we're overworking things. And so I think there is this piece about really discerning, particularly when it comes to hours of work, are the things you're working on, do they really need to be done now? And if you're not sure, ask. Because I know when I ask people to do things, they often think it must be the most important thing in the world. And it, just because I ask for it doesn't mean it is. So often I will say to, I'm learning to say to people, this is not mission critical. You, this can wait till next week. This certainly, you should not be burning the midnight oil on this. And, and so I think we all need to reflect on that as leaders, but we also need all of you to tell us where you're at. Because if you fall over or break, you're no good to you or your family or anyone else. And so we need to work out if you're headed in that direction before it happens. And that, that actually starts with you. And, and it starts with our leaders making it again, we're using that term again, a safe space to have that conversation. So, um, you know, I, I hope people do feel they can have those conversations and, and um, I encourage leaders to ask questions about level of comfort around that and to ask their people, how are they and are you really able to manage your current workload? Um, check in when it comes to what's going on in people's lives. I might just add to the second part of the question, um, Mark, which goes to kind of how we're supporting um, public servants in relation to appearances. I think we've seen such an explosion in royal commissions and inquiries over the last five years right across the country. And I think that um, we need to do a much better job of supporting individuals um, and, and being really clear about the intent in which these um, commissions have been formed, whether they're policy based, whether they are really kind of, you know, much more inquiry based and, and having conversations about you know how you do do the really good preparation how you are supported there's some great supports within the APS for um, public servants going forward but it's a very daunting process and, and no one's really ready for it until they are, are faced with having to appear so I think that um, there are things that we can do um, to make sure that people feel supported and comfortable and that they, they are able to share their story with Royal Commission from a perspective of we want to learn from Royal Commissions we want to make sure that if mistakes are made that there is a continual improvement process that we can actually draw a line in the sand and codify changes coming out of Royal Commissions. But supporting our people, because I do know that it has taken a toll, um, uh, not, not just Robodeb, but the range of Royal Commissions um, right across the country do take a, a toll on wellbeing and, and not just the individuals appearing, but entire teams. I know that um, we, we obviously have the Disability Royal Commission as well. And um, there, there is a lot of work that goes on right across departments and agencies in preparing a lot of material and, and how we better support that into the future, I think is a really good conversation. Thank you. And I think from, from listening to that, the, the takeaway that, that stood out for me the most is personal responsibility, whether as a leader, as a team member, or however we're fitting into the actual structure, we're personally responsible for how we actually negotiate that. And we need to be open and clear in our communication to our teams, with our managers, uh, with our colleagues and peers about what we need and how we can be supported and what support we can offer them, which um, I think leads nicely into a, a further question, which is how can we further encourage collaboration and working across silos 
while maintaining clear line of accountability for implementing government initiatives? I think I'd like to start with Helen on this one. Oh, I love this question. So thank you again, whoever asked that. 1APS. So there are some really practical ways that we can give people the authorising environment to collaborate. But that second part of the question on who's accountable, who's accountable and who is responsible is also really important. So as you think about who you need to talk to on whatever is in front of you, not only within your organisation, but outside your organisation, ask yourself who, e who else would be interested, who else needs to know about what I'm working on. And as you have those conversations, always keep coming back and grounding yourself on, well, actually, who is the accountable person, responsible person, minister, agency head here for ultimately kind of delivering, implementing, operationalising, whatever it is that you're working on. But I go back to my point, sometimes the best way to collaborate is to take people out for coffee and just have networks that you can draw on. I mean, gosh, who knew? Diversity matters. It's, you know, the, the research, the science is in. Diversity leads to much better outcomes and much better results. So go and talk to your colleagues. Couldn't agree more. Talking, you don't lose by talking, nor do you lose by listening. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, the next question is, what do you think can be done to retain staff and rebuild the culture of the APS so staff stay longer and skills and knowledge is not lost? Um, Natalie, if I could start with you. Yeah, look, um, I think this is this whole conversation, right? Um, so, uh, firstly, what I would say is maybe to go back to the very first question about Gen Z. I mean, there, there is, we're working less in a labour market these days where people think they're going to work for one organisation their whole lives. And, and so I, I do want to say, I think breadth of experience is important and that includes outside the APS. We want to retain our good people. We, but I kind of think, you know, let them fly and experiment and do other things and then be a place where people want to come back to. And so I, I think retention is important, but not just for its own sake. Um, we don't want people leaving because of bad experiences. We don't want people leaving because they don't have the flexibility to do their job. We don't want people leaving because they don't feel like they're, ha they're making an impact. But you know, I think we can and should be able to do all those things well. And um, in, in many ways, we need all of you to help us frame up that culture so that it is the kind of place where people feel like they are having an impact. They can have the flexibility they need um, and they're not having bad experiences. And if things go wrong, they can they feel like they're, they're safe to have a conversation about it. So these are things that I think about. Um, you know, I, I think that um, there is a lot to be gained through different experiences. And when I went out to the private sector after finishing up as Fair Work Ombudsman, I didn't, sometimes you're learning without realising you're learning. I don't think I realised how much I learned about different ways of working till I came back into the APS. And I, I felt this conservatism and I felt the hierarchy that, that made me feel I was a long way from the people who knew the stuff um, and the people who could tell me how we could reframe processes and cut through process as well. And so, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot for us to think about when it comes to culture. Um, but I also think retention for retention's sake is, is not the goal. Um, but I, I think we want to be a place that people can have a diverse experience in, that they can feel safe in and do impactful work. Um, and they can always come back to. I think that's a, that's a wonderful idea, especially the coming back because they bring other experiences that we can then use within our own organisations. Um, which actually leads quite nicely. There's a lot of good segue, segue working here. I'm sure the people who are doing the Slido stuff are, are working over time. So what opportunities do APS level staff um, have to share experiences of living with disability, including neurodiversity, to shift the narrative and better remove the barriers. Um, I think I'll start with Rebecca on this one. 
Thanks, Mark, for the question. And um, uh, I, I won't know all the different networks that already exist within the APS, but what I can talk to is uh, what is happening within our own agency. And, and we're starting from a perspective of um, uh, wanting to do more to get people to feel comfortable to talk about their neurodiversity quite openly in the workforce. There, as you know, there's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of barriers. So we're trying to create and, and, and build that culture of um, we are an employer of choice for people with neurodiversity but more generally for people with disability. It shocks me to my core, um, the low levels of um, executives we have within the NDIA um, with disability. I've um, been very open that um, uh, my um, KPI in this role is to have a person with disability in the CEO role within three years. And I really see it as my job to create a pipeline for people with disability within the NDIA to be going on to, to more senior roles and being able to mentor others right across the APS. I think that we have a lot of informal networks that exist right across the APS that we're not aware of. And I think that part of it is kind of how do we want to support those networks into the future. Um, but I think that um, uh, it really needs to be led by our, our people. I think that we've had a lot of goes previously of having a lot of top down um, uh, groups that kind of, you know, do wither out after a while. So I think allowing our people to really nurture and support those groups and networks with obviously um, senior leaders support is the way through. Thanks, Rebecca. I just got a, a, a question um, further either to you or to the rest of the panel on that, um, which is, do you think that this is partly uh, an unconscious bias that may exist because if you don't have somebody with neurodiversity needs or requirements, or you don't have somebody with um, other access requirements, it's overlooked because it's, it's the norm not to have that and not support that? And if that is, then how would, how would we actually... Um, contribute to making that a, a conscious bias so that we can actually try and remove it from our workplaces? It's a really good question and it's one that we are grappling with within the agency at the moment um, because if you, you, if you can't... Um, if people don't feel safe to um, come into an agency, obviously um, we're not going to be thinking about what are all the reasonable and necessary adjustments that you need for particular forms of disability um, or neurodiversity. And so one of the things we're looking at is the, the um, how do you develop a, a workforce strategy that thinks through the type of workforce we would like to have in the future? What are the things that would really attract people to our agency? What are the things that are going to make people be able to do their best work every day within the agency? Um, what are the things that we need to do to give them really flourishing careers by, as, as Nat says, not just staying within the agency responsible for disability, but being able to go and, and work in a whole diversity of roles. And when I speak to people with disability um, within the APS, that, that's something they're really looking for. They don't want to just be labelled as uh, working in the field of disability. They want to be able to work in a whole array of different spaces. So I think that when um, people start to see more people with disability in executive roles, they'll see what the opportunities are that are right across the APS. Okay. Thank you. Um, which, you know, so when we speak about mobility, uh, some agencies within the APS are less supportive of mobility, both internal and external. How is this likely to be addressed or changed? I'll start with um, Helen on this one, because look, it's across I'm all of the agencies. Yeah, good on you, Mark. And look, you know, I'm sorry to hear if someone's had that experience. And I, again, I'm going to point to the mobility framework and make sure that everyone understands, and Natalie's made some great points, and, and she's a secretary, that mobility is got, has got so many advantages, not just for the individual, but for the team and for the organisation. So if someone is experiencing um, or is having trouble having that conversation or they don't feel like they're supported, encourage you to go and talk to your sort of HR area, you know, talk to your coup. There's a range of people within an organisation that if you bring these sort of practical, tangible benefits, have a look at the mobility framework, to the conversation, I hope you get a better result. But yeah, just look at the mobility framework, go and talk to someone else in the organisation, but without a doubt, like again, the benefits are clear to you. I, I always go back to the fact that I can only kind of share my personal experience. I've tried to put myself, I've tried to walk in the shoes of most public servants. 
um, and I've really learnt to speak other people's languages and that's because I've chosen to go and do different things. Thanks, Helen. Um, so this one is a question for Rebecca. Um, knowing you're from the Victorian state government and sort of new to the APS, are there any workforce initiatives from the VPS that you think could work for the APS? Yeah, it's a really good question, Mark. And um, I worked across both New South Wales and Victoria, and it actually links to the earlier question about, you know, how do you break down silos and work in a much more multidisciplinary way? That, that's the only thing we know at a state level, um, uh, because when you are, are working more directly, I think, with community, you understand that people need to be at the centre um, and you can't just be bringing your agency kind of view to the table. You've got to be thinking about kind of what is in the best interest of the, be it the client, the, the person or the group that you're trying to design policy or service delivery for into the community. And I think that um, uh, like the, the state public services can learn a lot from the APS, I think the APS can learn a a lot about how you do break down silos and work very differently, very collaboratively. It doesn't always work, don't get me wrong, but I think when you're coming from a perspective of, you know, what is the, either the policy problem you're trying to solve, who is the person you're trying to support, it changes the dynamic in the room in terms of how departments work together. Um, so that that's a big thing that I'm going to try and bring to the agency um, uh, that I'm responsible for, is, is how do we work very differently, that obviously we provide um, packages to people with disability, but for us to deliver on the goals that um, people with disability have in their packages. We need to be working with every department. We need to be working with Nat's, Nat's department much more. We need to be working with our colleagues in the education department. We need to be working with colleagues um, from, from a transport perspective to make sure we're looking at issues of access. So um, that's definitely something that I think that we can absolutely learn from. Thanks. Um, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, just uh, in line with that, would would closer collaboration between the state services and the Commonwealth services get a, um, a better outcome for both organisations, do you think? Most definitely. I, I think sometimes we um, are overlook. There is already great collaboration that happens between the states and the Commonwealth every single day. And, and I saw that firsthand during COVID um, uh, in terms of the, the way that, that we worked. And I know, obviously, I was leading the Department of Justice at the time, but the, the work that we did with our federal colleagues, um, I will always remember that the level of collaboration and, and real understanding that happened between the states and the Commonwealth. I think there are a lot of areas we need to do a lot more work in terms of of uh, state Commonwealth collaboration. And there's always that natural tension in our federation, um, which I think is a really good thing. Um, I, I think, you know, that when we're looking at roles and responsibilities into the future of having a much, much more mutual respect between the states and the Commonwealth in terms of the respective roles that we play will make a big difference. But as I said, we do, we do a lot and we don't celebrate it enough um, in terms of where the good collaboration is already happening. Can, can I add to that? And this, this is a, yes. probably a less common example, but one perhaps we should be doing more often. So one thing I will say is, so I want to talk to an experience I had last week when I was in the Northern Territory. But first, I will reference the fact that I was once state manager in Victoria of the predecessor of my department. And one of the things that I quickly realised was that the people who were working in the Victorian office had really a much better sense of the lay of the land with the Victorian office, uh, with the Victorian government than anyone back in um, Rome, as I used to call it, Canberra. Um, and, um, and we often had this situation where people would come and visit from national office to Victorian government people and they wouldn't tell us and we'd be like, oh, we could have helped. Um, and so we need to use our people in the States better, point one. Um, but point two, you know, last week, um, I was one of a, a number of secretaries who sat down uh, across from our Northern Territory government counterparts to talk about uh, solutions for Alice Springs, for Central Australia. And I, I was reflecting on this, that the, you know, the, the Northern Territory government and, and the Central Australian challenges are, they're, they're kind of, they're not, not complex, they are very complex. Uh, long-standing, but they're confined, right? Um, like it's a particular area, a particular set of issues. And one of the things that's really clear, by the way, is if you don't collaborate, we'll never solve their problems. Our departmental structures bear little or no resemblance to the nature of the problems people feel on the ground. So 
they don't understand our departmental silos, let alone the silos within the departments, right? So forget about communicating with people about that. Um, but there was something quite extraordinary, I thought, of, of, of four secretaries sitting opposite our now Northern Territory, I think they're called C CEOs of departments there. When does that ever happen? You know, we, we see ministerial level councils about particular things, like in my department, there's a, a lot of work on skills going on at the moment, but that's just like skills uh, ministers and their, their um, public servants alongside them. But this was much broader. And I thought, well, we should be doing this more often. And what this comes to as well is the relationships, the relationships you formed. You know, we spent a day together, we had dinner together, and you hear about all sorts of things, you know, um, this program, that program, what we're doing here. And I'm like, oh, we're doing something like that. Now, it turns out my people were talking to their people. Awesome, system working. Not always <laughs> the case though, right? Um, and so there is something about all of us contributing to those better relationships and then feeding the intel up. And look, I know it's hard. You folk in Victoria, you might feel sometimes that the people upstairs in the ivory tower of Canberra aren't listening to you. Find a way through because what you know, because of the context in which you operate in the state is of value to us. And so we need to get better at creating systems for it. But hey, there's nothing stopping people kind of picking up the phone and chatting. I think we said that already once, didn't we? Here, here. <laughs> yeah. It bears repeating, so it's all good. Uh, so that actually talks about the brand and how we work about each other. So um, I'm going to direct this one to, to Helen. Um, Anthony Albanese has said many times that he wants the APS to be seen as an employer of choice. How can we achieve this and challenge the public perceptions of APS? In a whole range of ways, and we've already touched on some of them uh, today, it's that diversity point. How do we encourage, attract and retain a more diverse workforce? And that goes to the practical reality sometimes of recruitment. It means getting our employee value proposition right, which goes back to that question, how do we encourage more young people? It means getting the flexible work principles right. So that again, what's working for you is working for the team and working for the organisation. So there's a whole range of ways that we can make sure the public service is an employer of choice, capability, being really clear, so from the Commission's point of view and back to the Academy, the government wants you to be the best you can be. It wants you to have the capacity and capability to do your job well. So we are investing in training, in uh, not just the formal, because we've also talked about the informal. So there's a whole range of things that are going on at the moment, and the government has been clear when it comes to its ambitions under that Australian Public Service Reform banner, and I encourage you to get onto the Australian Public Service Reform website, because that's really gonna talk about all these things, about building the capability of public servants, about what we're doing when it comes to things like changing recruitment, employee value propositions, flexibility. Awesome, awesome. thanks Helen. I'm just um, looking at the next question and, and just wondering, I think this might be for all three of you, so if you could all be prepared. Um, are we going to see an increase in roles being advertised with no stipulated region location to truly support mobility and flexible working arrangements? I think the I'll answer is yes. I've, I've done it, but I'm going. <laughs> but I'm going to go to. I'm going to go to Rebecca. Where absolutely, that's yep. So thanks, Mark. Uh, right now, the NDIA we advertise our roles as Geelong, which is where our headquarters, all by negotiation, to make it clear that um, for the right candidate, we're really open to to looking at kind of where that person is located, um, uh, and really thinking through kind of what that then means for, for teams as well. Um, but no, we are from coming from a starting point that um, for most jobs in the agency, you should be able to do your job anywhere. Look, awesome. I, I think Thank it you. goes back to what we were saying before. It does depend on the role. Uh, there are some roles that, that kind of need to be done in situ, but 
there are lots of roles that don't and we learnt that during COVID and like Rebecca I, I spent a lot of time banged up in lockdown in Melbourne like a lot of you people uh, and so we learnt there that we could work differently but I think we also learnt it's not ideal to never have any real connection with people to always be connecting through a screen that certainly didn't work for me and I did not love being on my own all day, every day at home. Um, you know, I want to connect with people and I think that our relationships are richer for it. In my department, we do have people who work to Canberra-based teams all over the place. And so we will always have that conversation. We have a large cohort in our Melbourne office of people who do workplace relations and that team's based in, in Canberra. We have a, apparently we're calling it a skills hub. I don't know that that's official, but we have quite a few skills peeps in our uh, Melbourne office, um, in our Adelaide office as well. And so we're sort of already doing it in a kind of organic way. And we, we've got to plan it a bit better because we're running out of desks in Melbourne, I gather. Um, and so, um, so these are all that there's practical elements as well to work through because most people do want to go into an office some of the time. Um, and that piece about culture and connecting, you know, that that's hard to do if you're never with your team. So, so these are things we're balancing, but certainly we are advertising much more roles across a range of locations. But I think the way Rebecca's doing it is really good, that kind of by negotiation, because it depends on the role and the person. Yeah. Exactly. Which is actually, because um, that raises then the issue, which is the next question. Um, how is the APS developing leaders to manage those geographically dispersed teams, including staff who are working from home? And I will start with, with Rebecca because you're already um, uh, I was going to defer to Helen um, on, on this one. I think we can all answer it. It's hard. <laughs> one of the things that I've learned is an obvious one. But if people are coming on the screen, when the meeting ends, the meeting ends. So if you happen to be chairing a meeting where there are other people in your office, just because it might be practical, don't continue the conversation at the end of the meeting. So there are actually some really practical things that whoever is sort of chairing the meeting needs to be aware of. Some of it's obvious to make sure people feel comfortable bringing forward their point in whatever way best suits them. It doesn't suit everybody to talk on a screen, all right? So I often say in a meeting, I really want to hear from everyone, but that doesn't mean you need to be an extrovert and feel comfortable talking, you know, on camera in a screen. There's the ability to kind of have a chat, there's ability to send questions via email. So you have to kind of open up the forum and be very practical about the way that you encourage people to contribute. But yeah, I'm really interested in kind of, Natalie, because I'm still learning on the hop here. Yeah, look, and we all are, right? Um, so I'm going to say two things. One's a, something I learned in a previous role pre-COVID and another's a bit of a personal story that's a bit COVID related. Um, when I was Fair Work Ombudsman, I was really struck by the fact that the, the FWO organised not in geographical teams, but functional teams. And these functional teams had people everywhere because um, it's a service delivery agency as well, right? Like they've got inspectors out in the field and call centres and all sorts of things happening there. And, um, and so they were already learning how to do that. And they, there was a coming together, there was a travel overhead and we need to understand that that's a sensitivity because this government has asked us to reduce our travel costs. Um, but um, they were making that work well before COVID. So that's the first thing I say, right? Like it's just a different skill and it's not just on managers, it's on all of us, right? Because we're all working a bit differently and we need to understand how to communicate when we're not all together. Um, my COVID example is this. In like the second big lockdown, I get confused between them, um, at a certain point, um, do you remember when they went from Melbourne people from 10K to 5K, sorry, no, from 5K to 10K, we could go 10K away from our home. And this meant there was a particular friend that I could see because I, I could meet them at the tan and we could do a run or a walk around the tan and got out of the car and said hi to this really old friend of mine. And um, how are you? Now, then there was swearing. I'm, 
if it, if I, if it, like was more familiar with this audience, I probably would just repeat the conversation, but <laughs> there was some swearing. How are you? Nah, nah. And this person then said to me, my imposter syndrome's got dead set out of control. And I was like, oh, oh. And then I went home and Googled it. So imposter syndrome, I'm sure many of you have heard of that. I'm not going to explain it to you. But point being, and this goes to what Helen was just saying, when you're on the screen all the time, you don't get the informal. And for people who might have, and we all have it every now and again, a bit of self-doubt, how did that meeting go? What we're missing is the conversation right after the meeting back to the desk or whatever, because it just stops. And then usually you run to the bathroom because like you haven't been able to go to the bathroom for four hours because you've been on calls. And, but I was like, I Googled it and there was quite a bit of literature out there about isolation and working from home all the, t all the time being really bad for people who are already a bit vulnerable to imposter syndrome. So there's real complexity here. And, um, and like Helen said, it doesn't suit everyone to be on the screen all the time. I get exhausted. If I do a full day like that, I am so tired by the end of the day. I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to hear any more sound. Um, and my brain has literally stopped functioning and other than just, you know, keeping the heart and the breathing going. And so, um, whereas I don't find that when I'm meeting people face to face. So I think we all need to think for ourselves about what that means. And that's why I go back to it's not just about managers. Managers can't read your mind. Like how are you going with it um, and what works for you? And, and this evolves, you know, and so we need to be constantly checking in on one another around what is and isn't working and be prepared to shift. Now, oh, sorry, and Rebecca's going to jump in. I've got a statistic around imposter syndrome. 70% of us have it and the other 30% are lying. <laughs> <laughs> you like that. They, they're just really good at pretending to be super confident all the time. <laughs> but Rebecca was going to jump in. I, I think, you know, um, I really support uh, Nat's comments. You know, very similar that, that I, I can't be at home on Teams all day. I draw my energy from other people. And one of the things being in, um, I won't repeat the, because it's not true, the most locked down, you know, state in the world, um, being part of, of that state, we, we got to see firsthand the, the pressure on managers to manage in a very, very different way than they'd been used to before. And I think that learning and capturing that experience is really important in terms of how we put together training into the future, because some of the unforeseen things that we have seen um, uh, during um, the move to much more online working is um, I experienced a number of my staff who were um, victims of family violence. And, and we would have been able to pick that up much earlier in a workplace kind of situation. But we saw the decline of someone who was a very high performer very, very quickly. And I think giving managers more tips around some of the, the triggers and some of the signs you start to see when people are experiencing well-being issues or um, broader issues within their, their, their home, which is now, you know, also their workplace. And um, with all the extra pressures that, that people feel and kind of all the, the pressure that they feel about working from home and having to kind of do longer hours is, is what the experience has been for a lot of people. So I think there is some real learnings for us in terms of how do you get those cues when you're not inside a workplace that are really important for us to support um, people going through um, uh, different situations in their own lives. Rebecca's just given me some yeah. homework. I talked yeah. about the Emerging Leaders program that we're developing in the Commission and I just think it would be great if we tapped into more Victorians because mm. we've got so much to learn. Um, and can I just say too, because there is competitive federalism all the time, these are some of the best questions that we've had oh, as I we've think. done these State of Service <laughs> Roadshows. So thank you to all of you for great questions. Look, Helen, can I, sorry, I know we spent a lot of time on this. Um, I know um, that the experience of Victorians and not just Melbourne people, because when, if you're in country Victoria, you had that, you couldn't come to Melbourne, right? Like you had all your stuff going on too, is different from the rest of the country. You know, I have a lot of friends, my family's in Queensland, I have friends everywhere. And it really struck me that, I mean, maybe these are dramatic words, but the kind of collective trauma in Victoria was different. Um, and I swear, if, if someone's not doing a PhD on the, the psychological impacts of the online working environment, I'd be really surprised. But we do need to learn from it. And we do need to understand that, you know, we're not entirely done with COVID. I hope we're entirely done with lockdowns, but there are legacies of these different um, policies. I think if you're in Western Sydney, you'd probably also say that. And so we need as public servants, so firstly, self-awareness for ourselves. 
And secondly, as public servants, when we're making policies for the whole country, understand that. Yes. And uh, yeah, the, the legacy of the lockdowns, I think, is a gift that's going to keep on giving for a number of years yet. Um, Nat, this next question is directed for you. Um, I've noticed your recent post on LinkedIn was amazing. Uh, what can we do to support and encourage senior leaders to be more vulnerable and human? I'm not sure if I've lost you there. All right, listen, um, again, wonderful technology. If you can't hear us, Mark, we're just going to let um, Nat keep going. Um, All right. So maybe this is something I learned at Deloitte. Um, flatter structure, uh, as a partner, you've got a team of everything from junior to senior. And they always wanted to hear about you and your life. And I reckon when I first went into Deloitte, I found this weird because I was used to the public service where we just talked business all the time. And, and, um, and so one of the things that I learned, and then we all went through COVID, and so that people always really responded to hearing about what you really thought. And so um, when I took this job, I remember someone, a very senior person saying to me, um, you'll... You'll, you might need to think about like the persona you've developed on LinkedIn because I'd, I'd never had used LinkedIn at all before I became a consultant and then it kind of becomes your life. It's weird. But, um, and I thought, yeah, maybe I need to moderate. And then I thought, I might have said a swear word. What, like why? They knew who I was when they hired me. I'm too old for this. Um, and so I am a little bit cautious, but I was pretty surprised when, so I did a post about, if, for people who don't know, I did a um, I had gone to Brisbane for a, a milestone celebration for a friend of mine and it had, was post estimates week and I was exhausted and I was like, is it really, can I go to Brisbane for a week, like a day, like 24 hours almost and go out with my friends and a lot of my old friends were there and I thought a lot about doing it and I thought, oh, maybe I'll be too tired and I did it and I just reconnecting with my old friends, people who've known me for 30 years, um, it just reminded me how important that is. So, you know, I said before, you have to know what you need. And then you have to work out how, to, somehow you've got to prioritise it. And so I did a post about this and um, the Mandarin thought this was news, which I was completely bemused by. Um, like that's news. That wouldn't have been news in my old job if I'd made a post like that. But um, I have come to appreciate that that's not usually what people expect of secretaries. Um, I do still worry sometimes that I'm somehow upsetting the natural order of things, but all of the feedback I hear from junior to very senior people, including occasionally from a minister, um, is good. So I'm just going to keep doing it and um, I hope that that encourages others to do the same. And Mark, there's a great book, uh, Dare to Lead, by I think it's Renee Brown or Brenna mm. Brown, Brené all Brown, about like her. all about vulnerability. I didn't think I was being that vulnerable, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I just had a really good weekend um, with my oldest friends. And obviously, people are paying attention to it, so keep on doing it. Um, so, in regards to that, and it's all about vulnerability. Um, is the department thinking about how to support part-time? staff and people returning to work after time away, for example, maternity leave and enable ongoing development. Um, start, start with um, Natalie, but I think this is something that everyone may have an opinion on. Look, I, we can always do more. Um, in my, look, I do want to say, I don't necessarily recommending, re recommend consulting. Um, it's a pretty tough environment, right? So I'm, I'm telling you all the good things, but um, they're a bit more agile maybe, but we, we came up a year ago, I was the diversity, national, firm's diversity or gender diversity champion. And um, we released this policy that um, enabled people returning to work from parental leave to effectively have a f free day. Let me explain that. What that meant was you could come back four days and be paid five. You could come back three days and be paid four. Um, and, and this was to encourage more men to take parental leave um, and to encourage people um, 
to take the time they needed to adjust because it's not just about when the child arrives and the period of parental leave, but adjusting to life afterwards, especially when you still have a very young child. Um, and so we can always do more. One of the things I think, um, apparently this still happens uh, in the public service is people take parental leave and they have to hand all their stuff over. Like they hand their pass back in and they hand their phone in in some departments. Now that's just bollocks as far as I'm concerned. You're still, in, you haven't gone on holiday. Um, and the whole keeping in touch thing, how do you do that if uh, you've effectively handed all your, you, you go through an exit process. That's got to stop. Uh, it's on my list um, in my department. So there's always more we can do. I know that the the Act, the Commonwealth, I can't remember what it's called, Ellen. Public Service Act. The, parent, the oh, ma the Maternity Service Leave Act is, being reviewed, is yeah. being reviewed and it's going to be reformed. And yeah. so, you know, I, I think that um, there's a culture piece here as well about making sure we're having, again, those conversations about how people are feeling when they come back. Because often people get a bit of a knock to their confidence. Um, and so, again, leadership. And can I just say... The Maternity Leave Act, I mean, how's that for a state-of-the-art 1950s term? <laughs> so... Uh, Part of the reform could very well be changing the name of the Act. And I guess I'm reflecting on, is part-time going to be one of those terms again that we all look back and go, well, what, what was that? It's now just kind of flexible work arrangements. Yep, I'd agree with that. It's, it's part of what is now considered BAU, which is um, actually really encouraging because we're actually embracing... Um, what we're actually talking about in terms of encouraging people to work and contribute as they can um, in line with what the, their, their role requires, which is great. Um, so with, this one's actually to you, Helen, so I'll continue with you. So do you believe we are consistently applying the merit process? Not ranking applicants means the merit of successful candidate or candidates is often decided by one person. Can I just start by saying, and I'm sorry if this kind of comes across the one way, I have this saying, you can believe in God, but everything else has to be based on the facts and evidence. So it's not kind of whether I believe it's being implemented. Um, we do need to look at this. There is no doubt that we need to think about the way that we recruit people. The merit principle is going to remain at the core but I think what I'm going to do is guarantee to go and have a better look at this. So more homework for me. Um, and it goes back to that, you know, yes, we've got a process at the moment where it's a panel and there's a chair of a panel and a delegate. But it's something that I think uh, we do need to continue to think about. And it's that continuous improvement. It's got to remain at the core. But yeah, how can we do it better? Yep, I agree. Um, so the next question, um, and it will be the last one, is the International Women's Day was yesterday. As female leaders, what is one leadership advice that you have received that you must share with the audience? And we'll start with, um, with Natalie. Oh, um, <laughs> okay, so um, I've had a few gems in my career. Um, I'm going to share the advice I got when I moved from being a Chief Counsel of Workplace Relations in Canberra to State Manager in um, Victoria. And it's a very different job, right? So I was going from being like a lawyer type who knew all the answers um, to a role in Victoria where I knew nothing, right? Programs and dollars and people, a very different kind of risk. Um, and I remember saying, and I, I think I'm happy to share with who. Um, so Finn Pratt was my deputy secretary at the time. I think that was his role and maybe associate secretary. Anyway, um, I said to him, how do I know who to trust? You know, when I land in this new place and there's all these people and he said, trust everyone. And I've always hung on to that. I've always hung on to that. And, um, and I found that that placed me in good stead. L listen to people. Um, people are, everyone I think who, who works with us, they're trying to do the right thing, they know stuff, and you've got to hear what they've got to say. 
and you have to trust in their judgment. Now, sometimes people let you down, but hardly ever in my experience. Um, the other thing I'll say is people feel it when they're not trusted as a vibe. And, and so um, I thought that was a real piece of wisdom that he gave me. I'm conscious of time and I really want to hear from Rebecca. Yep. Yeah. I think uh, mine's along similar lines as Nat, so that there's two pieces. The first came from the extraordinary, and particularly I should, should mention extraordinary female public servant, Robin Cruck, um, uh, who's always been wonderful to me and, and given me a lot of wisdom. But she's Robin's always very good on trust your gut. Like in, in terms of when, when you feel that, that something's not right, trust your gut and, and call it out and feel that you can call it out. And, and particularly as we're looking at royal commissions and other things, I think that that advice has stood me in very, very good stead. And the, the second thing that I think that everyone's quite familiar with that I think about every day is the, the famous quotation of the behaviour you walk past is the behaviour you accept. And I'm very, very strong on being very, having zero tolerance um, within workplaces for be it bullying or harassment, because I think that particularly people look to um, leaders within the APS about kind of what that tolerance level is. And I think it's really important that we are really uni unified, that, that they are not part of our values. So they're two um, big pieces of advice that have stood me in good stead. Thank you. Helen, do you want to go quickly? All right, or I'll, shall we... I'll be quick because I am conscious of time. And it's very similar. And it goes to that point, you've got to be authentic. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to say when you don't know something. And it's also okay to personalise things. We're not perfect, all right? We're going to try and be the best we can be, just like you all are. So if I'm having a bit of a bad day or I might have that tone of voice, just acknowledge it, all right? We've all got a duty of care to each other. So yeah, it's about that ability as a leader, stay authentic, be a little bit vulnerable, and it is okay occasionally to personalise things and just say, I'm having a bad day. Thanks, Helen. Um, and that brings our panel discussion to a close. I would like to thank all of our speakers, Helen, Natalie, and Rebecca. And I'd also like to thank all of you for watching and contributing to the State of the Service Roadshow Victoria event. Um, before we sign out today, I would like to share with people a quick note on the Australian Government Leadership Network, of which I am a chair of for the Victorian Group. This leadership network sees APS staff of all levels in Victoria come together regularly, both in person and virtually, to discuss ideas and to connect. It is a great way to find out what is happening in other departments and broaden your professional knowledge and network. If you're interested in hearing more, you can sign up via the APSC website. The APSC events team should be putting the URL in the chat function now. Keep an eye out for a follow-up email from today's session as well. It will have further information about how you can share your own story of working in the Australian public service, like the stories we saw earlier on today in the APS Stories videos. It will also have a link to the recording of today's session. The State of the Service Roadshow series finishes today with our final event organised for our Northern Territory-based colleagues. Thank you all for attending.